Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Breachside Broadcast, home of the finest voxcasting either side of the breach. Loyalties have shifted in Malifaux, and another chapter of our story is coming to a close. But a new chapter is about to begin. A new era is dawning, and the events that have been put into motion will have ramifications on both sides of the breach. I hope you enjoy A Man Burns right after this word from our sponsor. This episode of the Breachside Broadcast is brought to you by the Malifaux Fire Marshal's office. The Fire Marshal would like to remind all residents that you are responsible for keeping your home or business safe by ensuring your fire exits are accessible at all times and adhering to capacity limits. The Fire Marshal recognises that this may be difficult if your home or business was recently bulldozed, is currently on fire or is an overcrowded warren. Nevertheless, we must all work together to keep the city safe in these trying times. Please report any infractions to the smoking ruins of the Fire Marshal's office. A Man Burns by Matthew Farrer A man burns, and the world softly fractures. For a time the manor was the centre of a great web whose spell strands reached across Malifaux taut as harp strings. Then, for a few brief and blazing minutes, it was an engine room, driving a great and invisible machine whose components were living men and women. Now it is a bullet hole shot into reality the centre of a spreading star of cracks in the face of the world. Nobody sees it. Nobody hears it. This cataclysm is too ethereal, too abstract to be captured with mundane senses. But it is too profound for the magical to miss or to ignore. To them, this is the blast of a volcano, the fall of a comet, the shadow against the sky as a tidal wave rises. With a slamming detonation, Lady Justice is dragged into the air, high over the battlefield streets. She struggles in the grip of two enormous radiant phantoms, swung back and forth over the river and the rooftops, helpless to break free. Every time one of her soldiers falls, the crow-headed giant gripping her left arm brightens and pulls her closer. Every time a walking corpse collapses back into the cold meat, the ram-headed figure holding her right arm drags her back. Justice's teeth are bared in agony and she feels her body and mind both coming apart. Perched unseen on a rooftop, a doll-like little creature in a miniature death marshal's coat tilts its hat back to watch her with its little stretched cloth mask of a face. Across the city, Misaki sits alone, eyes closed, her whole body shivering violently. Splinters of wood, shards of porcelain and scraps of cloth litter the room. She is trying to meditate. It is the only way she can stop what is happening around her. When her stillness breaks, every glance and thought become lightning flashes, and every word from her mouth or movement of her body become thunderclaps. Simply walking through this building practically demolished it. Mizaki will not shame her father or her sensei by giving in to fear. She calms herself and takes a breath, and the breath is a soft rumble of thunder that vibrates the debris across the floor. And sitting behind her, Mimicking her posture exactly, a wooden puppet dressed in imitation of a Tarakaji regards her impassively. It can wait forever if it has to, but it won't have to. What a night! What sort of fellow, Seamus asks himself as he bounds along a lightless alley in the quarantine zone, what sort of fellow could sit at home on his ass on a night like this? Well, McMorning apparently for a start... 
plonked mute on the tile in the middle of his mortuary floor while his ugly cobbled together inventions. No artistry to them, Seamus thinks. One thing about the haberdashery business, it teaches you a sense of style. All careen around the place, grappling and biting, trampling the lab equipment, and McMorning just sitting there moaning through his rictus grin with his eyes pleading with Seamus to do something. Well, that was a dull thing, and Nicodem wasn't much better. Seamus had laughed to see him at the top of a pyramid of dead folks not posing like some high and mighty graveyard king, but struggling with the angry corpses underneath him. So, with his colleagues indisposed, apparently, it's up to Seamus to hit the town on his own. That's all right, he'll make his own company. Tonight, Seamus is not the whippet lean rake who graces the guild's most wanted posters. He's a mass of grey-flashed muscles, brow-beetling, prognathous jaw turning his trademark smirk into a leer. Just ahead is the derelict pylon marking the mass graves of the unrest. Just a mite of work and he'll have some new friends, and then they'll find some warm-blooded folks and, Seamus giggles, they'll dance the night away. But when he comes to a shambling stop at the alley mouth, the grin drops from his face as he sees the little masked figure leaning on his staff. Its beaked face is expressionless and its eyes invisible, but Seamus knows it is looking at him, has been waiting for him. Seamus feels his flesh begin to rot. In a room high in a manor built between the city lights and the hanging tree, a man burns. And deep in the bayou, his portrait burns, but too fast, far too fast. Zoraida has been preparing for this, ever since she first set her omens and saw that fire was coming. Her home is fenced about with hexes and ambulates, hanging among the moss strands or buried in the wet earth, levees against the etheric flood. She has persuaded the Widow Weaver to breathe her image into the dreams of 333 children scattered all across Malifaux, scattering her spirit image into a mirror maze of tricks and shadows. And she has hung a print portrait of the Governor General, bought at a corner store at Hollow Point, in the fork of a tree, scrawled with symbols, stuck with feathers, scraps of cloth, and notes of guild scrip. Zoraida was ready for it to shudder, maybe break, maybe smolder. She was ready to hear it conduct the man's screams or even animate to portray his final moments. All that was important was that it captured the arc of power that she knows will seek her out. She has foreseen it. Every one of the touched ones, the ones who have come up in her cards time and time again, the mother of monsters, the fated sister, the captain of machines, the pugnatrix, the hanged man, all of them natural earthing points for this power like tall trees on a mountain top drawing the lightning. The portrait in the tree is the rider's lightning rod. It will protect her, carry the bolt safely down, leaving the rider the only one to hold a fistful of lightning in a dark and broken world. A moment ago she was smiling, licking her lips as the picture lit up, but that moment was all it took for the portrait to incinerate and the crude shrine to explode. To the eye, there is nothing more than a stir in the night fog between the little fire and the swamp hag. But Zoraida can feel the unleashed power leap from her broken trap and roar at her like a speeding train. Her eyes bulge in fear. She throws up a hand in front of her, for all the good that will do. Crouched in among a tangle of thorns behind her, the masked and spider-legged doll claps its hands as it watches its mother realize she is about to die. Alone in his most secret room, surrounded by the wreckage of his great work, a man burns. And so his work burns with him. The machine he made to lock thoughts and souls into step with his will is now flying apart, and all order is flying apart with it. The delirium spreads. At the top of the Honeypot Casino's grand stair stands an eye-searing storm of blue and purple light, bound into a human shape inside a shadow-grey frock coat. Images of cards, dice, swirling roulette numbers, and mahjong tiles flicker into visibility inside the churning blaze and vanish again. In the deep woods, the madly bucking monster, its human face barely recognizable, is setting the leaf, mold, and ferns alight with its touch. Its frame boils and changes, its horns, paws, hoofs, tusks, wings, scales all form and vanish. Flames leap from the crude stoves all around the enormous cookhouse. Wrapping around the whirling figure on the wreckage-strewn floor as the clan scramble for the doors, and the little lass crouches in the corner, howling for her ma to just please stop. Victor Ramos groans in panic as he watches limb after limb burst out of his body, limbs he can no longer control. 
His fresh-grown metal claws pluck up every tool and part and piece of scrap around him, remaking them. But into what? Colette Dubois is alone, but she fills the Star Theatre nevertheless. She called on the power she's become so used to by now, ready to manifest the triptych of herself and defend what is hers from the madness in the streets. And it made her a trio, but then it made her a trio of trios. She just kept unfolding out of herself, and now the crowd of Colette's is fighting itself, snarling and spitting, flinging their foulest insults and most shameful secrets in each other's faces. And who can say whether any of them is the real woman any more? And above all of her hangs the arcane effigy, smiling in triumph. Traceries lighting the air around it echo patterns on the floor of a distant room in which a man burns. These traceries are drawn on the empty air in grease paint, machine oil, and animal blood, the final elements forming out of frost and flame. The effigy spreads its arms, exultant. At the heart of a mandala made from souls and force, a man burns. And the flow of force bursts out of his pathetic tracery of channels once and for all, ready to shatter the spell of this strange and ancient world. And it changes. It falls on the world, no longer like a fire or a crack or a hammer, but like the lightning Zoraida had imagined it as, drawn and directed like electricity leaping along a new conduit. Seven new conduits. In less than a heartbeat, the mighty surge of power is gone, earthed and drained away. And in the ether's sudden dimness and calm, seven new stars silently glow. Zoraida gives a convulsive gasp of breath and opens her eyes. She's still standing exactly between the open door of her hut and the smoking wreckage of her trap shrine. Her hand is still out in front of her. She blinks. Sensations rush in on her. The clammy air, the insect songs in the lapping water, the tang of smoke, all so commonplace. The juggernaut of force that filled her senses a moment ago is gone. So is the steady, nerve-twanging tension from when the Governor-General had been winching his works tighter and tighter. The ether is as calm as one of Lilith's reflecting pools. Zoraida realizes how frightened she still is. And so it's with her heart in her mouth a moment later that she realizes something is moving behind her. She looks around, and then up, and up. She meets its eyes. It takes her some time to coax words out of her dry mouth. I know you. The mysterious emissary regards her for a moment longer. Its wooden limbs creak. Strange shapes grow, twine and writhe around its legs. Then it turns its back on her, and in silence it is gone. Blood runs from beneath Lady Justice's blindfold like tears. Her cheeks are glossy with it. The judge's withered flesh is riven and punctured. Around them the handful of marshals and guard push forward, shoulder to shoulder. From the streets around them come whistles and gunshots, and the shriek of a peacekeeper's steam klaxon. The enemy will go no further. They will retake their streets tonight. Every guild soldier on the battle line knows this. They know it because a vast dark shape descended from the rooftops to stand with them, staring at them from the depthless black sockets in the skull of its face, sword upraised. And every one of them heard its voice in their minds and their bones. Endure. Obey. Fight. They fight and the brutal emissary fights with them. In the bedraggled little village's main street, the mob of gremlins surges and jostles for position around the three bosses standing in an equilateral triangle of enmity. Ophelia, Summer, and Ma stand deadly still, only their eyes moving from one to another. It's known that every so often the big bosses will puff up, get big, get the way of doing stuff no gremlin knows how to do. And no secret either that the puffin' up went bad somehow, real messed up, and strange troubles all over. But before anyone goes starting trouble over it, they got to make out it was the other two's fault. It's custom. Ma's eyes flick to Summer, then Ophelia, as Ophelia's eyes go from Summer to Ma, as Summer's eyes cross with the effort of looking back and forth between Ma and Ophelia so fast. Their gazes hold stretch second by unbearable second. 
and then something ploughs through the wall of the drinking house, exploding out in a storm of smashed wood, a madly whirring wheel barely encasing the undulating pink blur of a pig and the luckless gremlin hanging in front of it. Coring with mirth on the top of the contraption is a pallid, maniacal gremlin none of the mobs have ever seen before. Whooping as its rolling machine scatters a woodpile, demolishes the south end of the tannery, and careens away into the bayou. There's silence for a moment. Then Ma shrugs. Ophelia shrugs. Summer waits for a dramatic interval, and then shrugs too. The show must go on. Colette isn't sure whether she's thought these words or actually managed to say them. But, well, it's true, isn't it? Something happened to her. Something she can't quite remember. But the show must go on. Her girls need her. She sits up. Her body aches and her eyes sting. Well, time to pull herself together. Or, she manages a laugh, to split herself up. But when she reaches for that strange invisible muscle that will flex and pull the power into her, it isn't there. There is something, something subtle and rarefied, that slips silkily through her fingers, but she's still too muzzy to quite grasp it. That's when she sees the creation standing in the auditorium, light shining from it, the dazzling azure of a summer sky. It bows, and out of sheer stunned reflex, Colette curtsies back to it. Then it points to the double doors. Work to do. The show must go on. Colette toils in place, and by the time she finishes the pirouette, she's standing at the doors. She pulls them open and marches out, and the arcane emissary follows her. It was once the Avatar of Dread. Now it is a lumpen corpse sprawled in an alleyway. Then suddenly its necrotizing meat heaves, bulges, and splits. An arm shoots out and reaches around to tear the split wider. Finally, an exhausted Seamus, once again his gaunt little self, manages to tear free of the hulking body he used to occupy, the cobble scraping his naked skin. He is crying. You won't cry, the voice says from above him. Yes, cry, thool. Seamus wails aloud and rolls over. The towering crow-headed shape in the musty robe leans down to him. Its voice is deep and warm. Seamus would swear he hears kindness in it. Crea den tau. Crea chai kalthira dao. The thing reaches up and takes something glistening from the corner of one of its hard, corvid eyes. It holds it out to Seamus, and unthinkingly he takes it. It sends a thrumming, freezing vibration through him that he never thought he would feel again. Ding dien fei, uth gran kai thira dao. And with a single thrumming downbeat of its wings, the carrion emissary vanishes upward into the night. Wild-eyed, laughing now, tears streaking his face, Seamus stares after it, until the breeze on his skin brings him out of the moment. He yelps in alarm at his nakedness and hurries back to the mound of meat he escaped from. He grabs the top hat from its collapsing head and puts it on his own. Sorted. The pack of Tarakaji and household guards quail in unison as Misaki points her basento at them. Tell me what is going on. There has been fighting in the city, but now I hear it inside the building. Tell me what is managing to cause such upheaval in my own house, she says calmly defying anyone to bring up the wreckage in her own room. Before any of them can speak, she has her answer. Something comes ricocheting along the passageway, leaving a trail of smoky shadow and hyena laughter behind it, ignoring a shearing bisento stroke that should have ended it. It stands for a moment in the narrow window at the passageway's end, a lithe and elegant shape in tauntingly familiar garb. Masaki rushes after it as it leaps out of the window, still laughing, still throwing off smoke and shadow. It turns as it falls, effortlessly acrobatic and grows in length and shape, until it has the form of a mighty dragon. Alice, Levesque says. His voice is scrupulously modulated, the voice of someone trying very hard not to startle an animal. Alice, I want you to lower the gun. 
Then I want you to holster your gun and make it very clear your hands are empty. Please believe me that I am as serious about this as I have ever been in anything that I have ever said to you. It's the mustache, isn't it? Rusty Alice answers him. Her gun is still trained on the left eye of the ridiculous codger perched on his mountainously laden donkey. You're scared of his mustache. I bet you can't even grow one. That's why he's got you so intimidated. Her tone is pure bored insolence, but her face betrays her nerves. She felt something. The same gut-tumbling hot flash she gets when Leviticus grows from the old man she works for into that weird horseman. But when she came running to see what was happening, she found him out in the street in front of captivating salvage and logistics, face to face with this thing. Alice blinks. She definitely just thought thing, not man. She wonders why. Then she looks into the man's eyes. Her gun arm drops to her side. There's a roaring in her ears. And then the donkey with its great pile of cargo and its deep-eyed rider is turning away, plodding down the empty street, fading into the night faster than it should with such a weary lack of speed. Alice looks over at Leviticus, who is inspecting something in his hand. Where's he going? Hell with that, where'd he come from? How'd he even get here? And did he give you something or take something? A little of each, Alice, a little of each. And as to... as to where... Leviticus voice trails off for a moment, and then his hand snaps shut around whatever it was holding, and his expression firms. He smiles. Come inside, Alice. We have a lot of work to do. And in the windowless room in the shattered manor, a man burns and burns out. That's it for another episode of the Breachside Broadcast. Join us next time for more Tales of Malifaux.